What is the biggest change in our time? What is behind this? What is behind that we can predict? We can predict the population in the future, not because we know what will happen. It is because of something that has already happened. Something has already happened. It's this. Number of babies born per woman. I start in 1800, this graph, go to 1900, to the year 2000 and beyond. And back in history, it was six babies born per woman, on average. Some women have many, some had few. We know from the census by the Chinese emperors how many children there were per woman. We know from all archive in Europe and the Middle East. We know from going to the rainforest up till today, people who are not living in modern modernity at all, on average, six children per woman. And then, this didn't change much. Look, here, when I was in college, 1965, it had fallen to only five. And many people, expert in Europe and North America, got very nervous and said, this will be a population explosion. And a man called Paul Ehrlich in California, professor in biology, uh, he said that there will be a population bomb. He wrote a book called Population Bomb. And the meaning of that book was that people in Asia was giving birth to a lot of children that would become poor and become communists and would attack America. That was the population bomb. It was like an atomic bomb, an attack on America. It wasn't his proposal. It was the editor who said, that's what we will write. It will fit. And then they, co they coined the concept population explosion. And some people still use it. Never, ever use that mouth. Take it out of your vocabulary. It's arrogant. It's telling other people that your children are terrorist bombs. Don't say that. Don't use that term. If you want to talk about it, it's fast population growth. It's a neutral way of saying it. Don't, don't make sort of n ugly nicknames about other people's children. It's very ill-perceived. And, and it's just routinely talked about. What has happened then during my lifetime? We know this very well, because if it's one data that is easy to collect, it's number of children per woman. Uh, uh, like income, how much people earn. This, that's difficult. Ooh, it's very difficult. The World Bank is struggling. We have 48 pages, and they ask a multiple, they ask a people. That's very difficult. To find out if women did abortion or not abortion, very sensitive. But number of children is easy. You train students, you send them around, they knock the door, the door open, the children come out to look, they're curious, you count them, one, two, three, four. <laughs> it's very straightforward. We have very good data. Of course, some children may be disabled and they are hidden, you know, some children have died and so on. But with these interviews, we know this number quite well. And we know for sure that this has happened. Two point five and continuing falling, but we are already there today. Imagine we were here discussing whether we ever would come down to this level, and because of this, the number of children have stopped increasing because eighty percent of the world population have kids who are vaccinated, girls in school, electricity at home, and under the pillow they have a condom or a little pill. And they have done the most wonderful thing that humanity ever did. We have separated reproduction from sexuality. When you have your loved one, you move in together and you say, darling, we'll make love tonight. But we'll wait with children. Huh? Or you will say, when that time has come, darling, let's make a baby tonight. I have three. Uh, and my wife is called Agneta, and we went to the same class in school, and we are married since. Uh, so, We have said so many times, let's have sex tonight, and we have said, on those occasions, let's make a baby tonight.
but we could separate them. And what am I talking about? You know, I, it's not a joke. Think about it really seriously. What are the two forces in life? It's the intimacy of sexuality or being ultimately close with the one you love most. That's one of the best things in life. Eh? As I said, you will never stand living together with other, any other person if it wasn't for sex. You know? <laughs> That's what everything, it makes up for all the rest. You know? <laughs> and, and, and the other thing, the lovely thing of being able together to have a child, to rear a child and see a child growing with the responsibility and the happiness that is. And we can disentangle that. So we can enjoy both of them, not to the maximum. Of course, these are also the major problems in life, isn't it? The pangs of despised love, you know, the bad sex you have had, you know, and, and, and uh, kids who misbehave or parents who are terrible. What is worst in life is also the best in life. And the way that we have taken that apart, that's a real advance for human beings. And it has been done because of a spiritual, a moral, you know, a value change and wonderful little rubber technology and pharmacological technology you know, that enable us to do this. And don't let be just mystic. Free and safe abortions. Without free and safe abortion, we can't make it. We need 40 million abortions per year and all are not safe. And there's no way we could do this. There's illusions that you can live without abortion. And stupid politicians like Ceausescu, the communist dictator in Romania, have tried to do away with abortion with disastrous effect. And there are some other politicians that for different reasons start talking about doing away with abortion. There's no way, no country is living without abortion. There are 40 million abortions per year in the world. And saying that you can live without it is an illusion, it's a naivety. Then you can handle them in different ways. Then you can support women in different ways to give women a true choice, whether to have this baby or to make this abortion. But let it be a woman's choice. Eh? But don't force them one way or the other. Eh? That's what we have seen in the world that works out. So how did this play out in region? In Europe, it started early. Eh? America came a little later, and they had a baby boom after the Second World War. And then they came down. Europe is now down to 1.5 on average. Americas, including Latin America, is on two. Brazil, that big Catholic country, make 1.8 children per woman. And Sweden, the almost secular Protestant country, we make 1.95. <laughs> the Brazilian may be good at football, but we are better in the bedroom. Yeah? <laughs> and in the homes, uh, we have a more Child friend, I shouldn't bra brag like that. I mean, we are lucky in Sweden. We have a good economy. We have, we have had peace. We have been able to set aside money for good daycare center, for parental leaves and all these things, you know. And there's quite a lot of political unity of it. It's not so much, so much uh, fuss about it. Asia here, very high, then came down fast like that. Down to two, very fast. And Africa, is anything happening in Africa? Will ever Africa change? Yes! Here it's coming. Some part of Africa is already down here. What we don't know is how fast Africa will come down. It may be faster. There are some estimates of independent institutes to say it may go faster in Africa. Others say, no, no, the remote rural parts of Africa are moving so slow and there's also war situation. So this is an uncertainty. But the big uncertainty, where will we land here? Will the world be like Sweden or like Germany? Countries so close. And one have one child, 1.5 per woman, and Sweden have two. Germany 1.5, Sweden two. It's quite interesting that seemingly similar countries have different number of children. And different countries, like Sweden and United States are different in many ways, but have two children per woman, both of them. And we can, we can, you know, oh, those Americans are so vulgar, they are so mm, uh, market econ economy oriented, and they say those are socialists in Swedes, but we make the same amount of kids. So, so there are many determinants for this. There are many ways you have to look very carefully for it. Let me show you this if I use a bubble graph. This is my beloved bubble graph here. You may have seen it. Every country is a bubble. Huh? Every country is a bubble. And the size of the bubble is the population. India and China is here. This is 1965. The red ones are Asia. 
The yellow ones are Europe, the green are America, and the blue are Africa. And, and, and uh, what I show here is the developed countries or the Western world in 1965, 50 years ago, they had a length of life of 70 years. This is long life, this is short life. This is small family, this is large family. Look at the world 50 years ago. Two groups of countries. One cluster down here with long life and small family. A big cluster up here, the developing countries. They had large families and they had short lives because many died young. Many died young. Now, how has the world changed? This data may not be so perfect, but the change is so big. So you can forget about data uncertainty. The change is so big. Those changes that happen not only... This is the bedroom. Eh? This is whether there's a condom or a pill under the pillow. Eh? And whether there is that wonderful pillow talk. Baby, what should we do tonight? My darling, what should we do tonight? Sexy baby. Eh? That talk, that's here. Life expectancy is not so much about the bedroom. It's about the bathroom. You have a decent bathroom with good hygiene. You have a decent kitchen, you know, and you have food, you know, you have good nutrition. And if so, you may have a health service and you have education. Then you live long. Huh? So you can see how different the world was. It was really two types of countries, developed and developing. And the definition of developed country was having more than five children per woman. Now look what has happened. We will start the world. And here it goes, 66, 67. This is China under Mao Zedong. Now they start family planning and it falls like this. Look at Brazil. They don't care about the Pope and the Vatican. They put on the condom and they come down here. No, this is Indonesia. It's coming here. This is, this is Bangladesh overtaking India. They're moving like this. And look here, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is an enormously successful country. It's coming here very fast and the world has changed completely. You have... You have this enormous change. Look, from this divided world up there and then down here, there's not two groups any longer. The globalization started in the bedroom. You see, it's 2.5 children per woman here. It's the average. 70 years is the average here. Uh, and, and this means... But most, can you see now, most countries are closest to the best. Eh? And then there are some who lags behind here. And also when it's number of children per woman, most countries are down here. These are the 80%. These are the 80% that go to school, they are vaccinated, you know, they have electricity at home. Then some are lagging behind. And countries lagging behind are, of course, countries with war like Congo, like Afghanistan, eh? like Mali, eh? like... Somalia. They're estimated, they're up there. Now, and in photos, in Mexico, the Catholics in Mexico, they have two children, they build their home there. This is exactly like me in the 1950s, early 1950s. My father and mother building a little home where we could stay with bathroom, nice water and so on, you know. And this is having a little motorbike going to the beach. This is also me and my brother when I was young. It was like this. This is before. This is, and that's Vietnam. That's Buddhist. These are Muslims in, in, in Bangladesh. Father is an entrepreneur. He has a bicycle, a rickshaw. They have two daughters, and they are going to work hard, that couple. Average number of children per woman in Muslim Bangladesh, 2.2. The Swedish population think that it's way higher. Huh? And they're 2.2. And girls go longer to schools than boys in Bangladesh today. It's a densely populated country. In the past, when I was a student, we said Bangladesh will be a catastrophe of flooding and famine. No, they changed it. It's a miracle that has happened in Bangladesh. Huh? Hindus in India, those ones have probably an income above average, but two children is the most common family in India. The number of children have stopped increasing in India. They have 2.4. Huh? And here are Coptic Christians in Addis Ababa. This family have two, but the average in Addis Ababa today is 1.6 children per woman, less than Stockholm. Because women are now getting a high level of education in the capital of Ethiopia. And, and they are changing the pattern like that. So an overview would be like this. In the past, the two parents on average got six children.